Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to be discussing cestodes, otherwise known as tapeworms. We're going to discuss a little about how they're classified, and we're going to go into their biology just to give you a feeling for what it's all about, but we'll give you some more examples as we tour the parasites that are called tapeworms that infect humans. There are two orders in the platyhelminthes phylum that encompass all of the tapeworms known to infect mammals and fish. The adults of these worms collectively occupy the small intestinal tract of all of those kinds of animals. So we're dealing now with a parasite which can grow to great lengths. Some of them can reach lengths of up to 30 feet. But believe it or not, uh, the larger the worm, the less likely it is that it's causing any pathological effect on its host. It just sort of lives there and absorbs some of the food that the host ingests. That's all it's asking. There are f 24 different families that encompass all of the world of tapeworms. Yet only four of those contain organisms which humans can acquire through the ingestion of various foodstuffs. And as we'll see, their life cycles are very interesting, very complex. And yet, there are many, 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 many people out there that are infected with these organisms. Let's talk a little about what a tapeworm is. Now, the anatomy is uh, quite interesting because unlike the other worms that we've discussed so far, namely the nematodes, tapeworms are missing a certain portion of their anatomy that you would, might expect to be there since they live in the small intestine and they absorb food from the host, well, then that means they probably have a gut tract, right? Well, it turns out that they don't have a gut tract. In fact, many people refer to tapeworms as gutless wonders. Now, how do they feed then? Well, let's begin with the head of this worm because it has a head, a middle, and an end. The head end of this worm is called the scolex. And depending on the tapeworm species, the scolex can either contain sucker discs, which it uses to hold on to in the small intestine, or it contains hooklets and sucker discs so that it can really hold on in the small intestine. The worm then generates the rest of itself from this little neck region right over here. And each of these segments that are produced move down the length of this colonial organism because each one of these segments is anatomically independent of the one before that. And as it moves down, as new segments are added to the adult worm, these proglottids, as they're called, that's the official word for those segments, um, undergo maturation. And the maturation process involves the generation of uh, organs, and these organs include male and female sex organs, as well as organs uh, to allow it to excrete metabolic wastes. But it doesn't have a gut tract. So where does it, how does it get its food? And the answer is quite simple. The tapeworm gets its food the same way we get our food, not by ingesting, but by absorbing across the surface of cells. So in our small intestine, we have columnar cells, and the surface of those columnar cells are um, constructed in a way that allows for maximum surface uh, exposure to the luminal contents of the small intestine, therefore maximizing the rate of absorption. And indeed, uh, we've got mechanisms for absorbing things that involve both passive and active transport. The same is true for the tapeworm. This is a mirror image of our columnar cells. The outer surface of this tapeworm from the head all the way down to the last segment is covered with small microvilli, and their function is quite simple, and that is to absorb materials from the outside in the lumen of the small intestine. So this worm is quite amazing in terms of its uh, ability to survive. And what uh, would ordinarily be... Um, not a hostile environment necessarily, but an environment which uh, challenges parasites that live there to obtain their nutrition. 
So as we move down the length of this worm, we first of all get to the, these are the immature segments. They don't contain any well-developed organ, organs at all. The middle portion of the tapeworm, which again can be as long as 20 or 30 feet, contains a well-developed proglottids with uh, the sex organs fully developed. Finally, we get to the gravid proglottid. So we have the mature proglottid with all the sex organs producing eggs, which are fertilized not necessarily by the same segment, but by adjacent segments, because this worm folds back on itself in the gut tract. Let me show you some examples of uh, a portion of these worms, just for um, illustration's sake. We have uh, some specimens that we've collected from various patients. Here's one. This is a, a series of proglottids that were obtained after uh, giving a certain drug to a patient that was identified as having tania saginata infection which is our next organism of discussion. And we can see some more segments in this here, in this jar, this uh, preservation jar. And uh, I believe that uh, we have a complete se a series of segments that goes from the immature to the mature to the gravid. We'll come back to these later when we discuss the organisms. So the purpose of this tapeworm, of course, is to make another tapeworm. That's the purpose of life, right? Reproduction. So the last segments, <clears throat> called gravid proglottids, contain mature eggs that have been fertilized, and there are thousands of eggs in each one of these segments. When the gravid proglottid is fully developed, it then separates itself from the colony of segments and passes out of the host in the feces. The eggs are then released into the environment, and then something happens to those eggs. And we'll discuss what happens to those eggs with regards to each one of the tapeworms that we'll be uh, discussing later on. Shown here is an entire tapeworm laid out for your uh, viewing enjoyment, so to speak. The arrow points to the scolex, the head of the worm, which is quite small compared to the rest of the organism. And we've wound this worm up in a spiral pattern to show you exactly how long a tapeworm this particular one was. And we think we measured this tapeworm at 23 feet. And this is a, an example of an adult Tania saginata tapeworm. Now, not all tapeworms are big. Some are quite small, actually. The one depicted over here with all these labels on it is a tapeworm that infects dogs. It's called Echinococcus granulosus or the dog tapeworm. And there are only four segments in the entire tapeworm. Over here, there can be thousands, well, hundreds of segments, I should say. But in this tapeworm, there are only four. And the last one, of course, contains all the eggs, and it keeps breaking off, and a new segment is added on in the neck region of this tapeworm. And this is a very small tapeworm. In fact, it's so small that you need a microscope to see all of the structures of it. And here are some examples of tapeworm eggs, and they vary in terms of their morphology, their size, and their shapes. And each size and shaped egg is characteristic of a particular species or genera of tapeworms. <clears throat> when we look at these eggs, for instance, these are the eggs of Tinea uh, species, or Teneid, in terms of the generic name for it, the Tinea group. The, all of them produce eggs that look identical. So we really can't tell the difference between Tania saginata, for instance, and Tania solium. These are two tapeworms that infect humans. When we look at the eggs, we, we can't tell them apart. We have to do other tests in order to say which species we're infected with. Whereas if we look at this particular egg, uh, it's quite characteristic, and it's a, sort of a tapered shaped egg. The back end of the egg is over here, and the front end is over here. And we know it's the front end because it has a little lid on it. It's called an operculum. And this little lid is uh, forced to open <clears throat> when this egg is uh, deposited in a certain environment, in this case, an aquatic environment. And out comes a stage that starts the life cycle of that particular parasite. We have eggs that are produced in clusters, and we have eggs that are produced singly. That is to say, they're expressed from the host as single eggs. And in some cases, the eggs are not expressed until the proglottids are actually uh, evacuated from the host, 
and then they disintegrate and release their eggs into the environment. So the life cycles are rather complicated in terms of even how the eggs uh, manage to reach the next host. What we do know is that all tapeworms have a complicated life cycle that involves either an intermediate host or a juvenile stage. So that when the egg actually does hatch, the stage that comes out is not the stage that ends up causing the adult infection in the gut tract of the definitive host. And again, too much detail right now. We'll, we'll come to each one of these and we'll explain more about that as the biology unfolds. <clears throat> Once again, just to reiterate, all adult tapeworms live in the lumen of the small intestine. And here's a very interesting shot of an adult tapeworm that's attached to the surface of the intestinal epithelium over here. And the tapeworm segments are shown tapering off into the distance of the small intestine. And this is a wonderful endoscope picture of, uh, of an in situ adult tapeworm. Very rare to see, actually. Hello again. Now, these are just some images, and they're teasers for what's about to come. But the clinical manifestations we're going to see, and this is a theme that we've repeated several times, are going to be based upon the niche. If you have a parasite that is staying in the lumen of the intestinal tract, we may very well have intestinal manifestations. But when that niche is no longer the intestinal tract, but is actually our CNS, we're going to see very different manifestations as we see here. So going forward, each time I talk about the clinical manifestations, I want everybody to be thinking about how these symptoms and signs are triggered by the particular niche that the parasite is occupying. Again, don't uh, worry about the lack of detail now because we'll add it as we go along. Uh, if you want to know more about the evolutionary developmental biology of cestodes, uh, here's an excellent review article that I've selected for you that's uh, fairly recent. <clears throat> We've discussed tapeworms at least three different times on microbe.tv uh, uh, slash twip. And uh, we recommend you go listen because uh, some of these stories don't relate exactly to the parasite itself, but rather some of its biology that we may not cover uh, when we come to discussing the clinical aspects of, of tapeworm infections. So the next time we meet, we'll be discussing Tania saginata, our first example of an adult tapeworm that infects humans. Thanks for listening. Thank you.